following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Let us remember how the Bible written by Moses, the Torah, explains what we call the initiation. We explained that the word Mizrahim that is translated in English as Egypt is a word that hides the mysteries of initiation. If we visualize, as we explain in other lectures, the land of Egypt, you will discover that the main element in that land of Egypt, in Africa, is precisely the River Nile and the delta of that river that enters into the Mediterranean Sea, which we explain already relates to the waters of our central nervous system. Because when we read the Bible, we find that the founder of Judaism, according to Genesis, whose name is Abraham, and that is the first graphic that we find in this uh, PDF, was the one that came from the city of Ur, what is written Aur. And in uh, many lectures, we stated that uh, Abraham represents the Sephira Hesed that emanates precisely from the Logos, the Holy Trinity, that is one with the ends of or, the third aspect of the absolute. So the innermost, our inner being, Abraham, emanated from that Kabbalistic alchemical point of view from the city of Ur, which is spelled A-Ur. And from there, as we read in the book of Genesis, when it went into the land of Egypt. And that land of Egypt is uh, Mizrahim in Hebrew. And we explain that Mizrahim uh, contains between the two mems, which represents the water, hides the water. The, the word mime, which means water, hides the, the word Miriam, which is uh, the Hebrew name for the mother of Jesus, 
because it represents the Sefirah Malkut. And Mizrahim is the last word that we read, which is precisely holding the letter Zadi in between in order to point that what we are pointing or talking about is chastity because the letter Tzadi relates to the righteous being or the righteous initiate, the alchemist, that is not a fornicator, that is an alchemist. That's why the word Mizrahim that is translated as Egypt relates, of course, to that land that we have in our central nervous system that uh, is called Egypt in English. If we understand that the waters of the Nile represents that uh, waters within which the spinal medulla is floating and that uh, the brain is floating in that waters also that we call the Mediterranean Sea. If we imagine that Mediterranean Sea and the River Nile, and then we picture the central nervous system of the human alchemist. In front of that human being is Arabia, which is after the Red Sea. And obviously, uh, the first word that we find, or land that we find after Egypt, is what we call the Mount of Sinai in Arabia. From that point of view, we understand that in order to go to that land, Arabia, or Sinai, which the Bible talks about in Exodus, we had to be alchemists. And that's why uh, when we enter into initiation, we enter into the mysteries of Egypt. It's not like people think that certain rays went from certain lands of Chaldea with Abraham, etc., and finally they end in Egypt and they build the pyramids. That's, of course, a literal interpretation that has nothing to do with what Moses wrote, which was a guidance for the alchemists. And, of course, we are talking about that in the different precepts that we are addressing. And the Bible is full of statements related with this science of alchemy that, unfortunately, people ignore. But we know, and we are given these uh, explanations in order for all of us to know how to enter into the initiation. So, if we enter into the initiation, we enter into the land of Egypt, Mizraim. Working with the waters of the River Nile and the Mediterranean, the central nervous system, which is the throne of Abraham. So Abraham has to come from Hesed down into Malkut. That's precisely the dissension of the spirit into our physicality in order to start manipulating the waters because he said is precisely that spirit that in the beginning was hovering upon the face of the waters, our sexual waters, represented, I repeat, in the central nervous system, in the sexual glands. Those are the creative sexual waters that the spirit has said has to control. Now we are reaching at the level in which he said, Abraham, the innermost, is reaching what we call the fifth initiation of major mysteries, according to the writings of Moses. Then, Abraham, or the innermost, has two ways, how to decide which of the two ways to follow. But Moses wrote the two ways in a very symbolic manner in order for us to understand that once we reach 
Tiferet, which is the human soul, the fifth initiation of major mysteries. The alchemist is behind the dilemma or following the spiral path or the direct path. And it's precisely what we call the second aspect of Exodus. Remember that in other lecture we explained that Matthew Samael on the or stated that we have to make three selections. The first selection is when the initiate through alchemy enter into initiation. For that, the students have to receive lectures, have to comprehend the doctrine, and when they decide to enter into the path of the science of alchemy, they enter into initiation, they enter into Egypt in order to manipulate the waters of their Nile and the Mediterranean forces in themselves. Remember that the Mediterranean means in the middle of the earth or two earths, which is our physicality, a brain. So that first selection, the initiative is of course working and working in different initiations, the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And then when he enters into the fifth, he is going to choose to follow the second selection or not to follow the, sex, uh, the second selection, which is a very high work that the alchemist has to perform after reaching mastery. And it's presented by Abraham. And regarding or related to this uh, statement, we read by this uh, alchemist, Kabbalist, Paul of Tarsus, the following quotation that you can uh, read in the second uh, graphic. He said, tell me you whose will is to be under the law. Do you not hear how the law is applied? For it is written that Abraham has said, have two sons, the one by the bone maid, the other by a free woman. But the one who was of the bond woman was born after the law of reincarnation in the flesh, which is, of course, the spiral path. But he of the free woman was by the promise in that. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants of fire. The one from the Mount Sinai, which through the spiral path engenders to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, in answer to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children, the Pratyeka Buddhas. But Jerusalem, which is above in that, is free, which is Ela Yam, the sea goddess, the mother of all of us, the Bodhisattvas. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, she who does not bear, break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in physical labor. For the children of the desolate in Malkut will be more than those of she who has a husband in that. Now we, brethren, alchemists, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise in that. But as then, the one who was born after the law of reincarnation in the flesh persecuted the one who was born in that after the Holy Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what says the scripture? Cast out the bond woman and her children, for the children of the bond woman shall not be heirs of Chochmah, as with the children of the free woman. So then, brethren, 
We bodhisattvas are not children of the bondwoman, but children of the free. Galatians chapter 4, 21 to 31. So as you see here, Paul of Tarsus is addressing the initiates, the alchemists, not as people think, believers on, in something. It's those that already are doing the work, but most of the alchemists that reach the fifth initiation of mere mysteries, they choose to be under the law. What is to be under the law? The law of karma, of course. Because they reincarnate periodically in Malkut in order to pay what they owe karmically and in order to annihilate their egos and slowly going up towards the absolute through many cosmic days. While the initiate that chooses to be a son of the free woman, that free woman, of course, represents that. Because Malkut is the will of Samsara, in which we apply the law of evolution, devolution, and many Buddha pratyekas that reincarnate here, they are still with ego. And they are developing themselves under the law. Because while we have defects, vices, and errors, we are under the law of karma. Because the law of karma controls the ego, controls those negative forces. While the free woman, which is precisely uh, the superior forces of the Divine Mother, represented in this case by Sarah in the graphic, is the one that begat Isaac, and Isaac represents the divine soul, Geburah, which in the initiate, of course, is the one that, uh, part of the initiate that descends with all the attributes or archetypes of Israel in order to perform the great work, the annihilation of all those defects and vices which are, of course, represented in the Exodus, in order to achieve the complete self-realization, in order to be clean completely of karma. In order to be clean of karma, we have to annihilate the ego. Because the ego is under, under the law. But there are many, thousands, of initiates that prefer to go in the spiral path and they do not uh, follow the direct path because it's very uh, strict, demanding. Initiates from the direct path are Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, that always show and teach how to kill how to annihilate our different vices and errors, which are written in different books in a symbolic manner. Only the alchemists know that they're talking about these relatives that we have within that we call egos. So that's precisely the point in this matter related uh, uh, with Abraham and the pact of fire. The main point here is that the word Bereshith, that is translated in the Bible as Genesis, is explained in many uh, lectures with different ways. But the main point here is Brit Esh, which means pact of fire that relates to the circumcision. And that pact of fire that uh, all of us have to follow which is chastity. Because the main point in circumcision is to eliminate that uh, uh, flesh prepucius from the male organ in order for, uh, to understand the meaning of what we are stating here. To eliminate the animal sensations from the sexual organ 
in order for the initiate, the alchemist, to learn how to transmute the sexual energy. And in this point, we have to understand what is precisely this Brit Esh, because it's related with the letter Yad, the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet that we spoke plenty in other lectures. Remember that the letter Yad, which is just a spot in the Hebrew alphabet, represents Keter, the first emanation of the Ains of Or, or that light. This is a point of the space. And that's why the holy name of God always is yod Hey vav Hey. And that we explain in many lectures. But if we count the ten sephiroth from Keter down without taking into account that, because that is just the mysterious sephirah that represents the tree of good and evil. So we count from Keter, one, Chokhmah, two, Bina, three, Chesed, fourth, Geburah, the fifth, the sixth, Tifereth, Nexah, the seventh, Hod, the eighth, ninth, Yesod, and the tenth, Malkut. So in other words, Malkut, the number 10, represents also the letter Yad. So if we look the letter Yad as Keter here, we also know that Malkut, which is the number 10, is Yad too, according to the numbers of the letters. So this letter Yad hides many mysteries that we have to comprehend. In the previous lecture, we explained that the Yad, as light, descends as a lightning from Keter going down into Malkut. So when that light reaches Malkut, still is light. And that is the tenth. Or what we talk in other lectures, the tithe. We call the ten percent. Alchemically speaking, the ten percent of the energy of Christ or the uh, unknowable divine is here in the physical plane in our sexual energy. Because Kabbalistically, alchemically, Yad represents the phallus. And He represents the yoni, the vagina. So Yod Hey, Vav Hey, Vav is man and Hey is woman again. So the letter Hey here is very important because it's repeated in the holy name of God, Yod Hey, Vav Hey. So Hey, of course, represents also Malkut, as we explain in many lectures. Because the tree of life is synthesized in four worlds. The world of Asiluth, the world of Bria, the world of Yetzirah, and the world of Asya. And the world of Asya, which is Malkut, is the fourth. And the fourth letter of the holy name of God is He. So when we are addressing Malkut, we are addressing He. And that He is our physicality. But when we said Yad, the letter Yad, alchemically speaking, is the Shakti potential of our physicality. In other words, if we want to find the most powerful energy in our physicality, we find that it is represented by the letter Yad, and it is precisely the tenth, or the tithe, in other words, in ourselves. And this is very important to comprehend in order to understand the precepts of alchemy. We read in the next graphic what we already stated in many other lectures, and we repeat. In the ancient book of Enoch, the course of Nahera, 
or Naher, as we say, the celestial river of life, better said, heavenly river, river of light, is described as resembling the letter Yod, or creative sexual potential, which enters into the composition of the 72 divine names of yod Hey, vav Hey, imprinted on the body of a child at time of birth and denotes its purity. The first letter Yad, or fiery Shakti potential, opens Yasod foundation of the tree of life, the spine, as if it were the womb of the second, the letter He, by means of which the Yad, the fiery Shakti potential, becomes fruitful along the tree of life, the Vav, the spine. That is what the Zohar states. So as you see, the book of Enoch describes the river that comes from the head of the Ancient of Days down to Malkut as a river of life, a river of light. The extension of that of the letter Yad becomes the letter Vav, in other words, because that descent is from the top of our head down to the sp through the spinal column into the sexual organs. And uh, we read uh, uh, in Exodus chapter 13, verse 2, the following. Sanctify me in every forge, that Shakti potential or yod of the sperm, which cleaves the womb of every woman a slave in Malkut. Among the alchemists, that is to say, the children archetypes of Israel, who are trapped in Mithraim, among Adam in Tifereth, the heart, and Amon Behema, sexual animal potency. It is mine. This quotation helps us to remember how to return in Yesod, the forge of Vulcan, the Holy Spirit, the Teomer Malogos, the high divine life of our Yam sexual waters. Chaim, back to the ends of or or solar absolute. So in other words, as you see, uh, read here, sanctify me in every forge. What forge? A forge is where you are working with fire. Means in every sexual act, give to me. Dissect sexual shakti potential which is in the sperm in the oven because usually in the sexual animal act what the couple do in the sexual act is to reach the orgasm through the orgasm we lose the fire the, sh the shakti potential that nature and the cosmos store there in our sexual glands but when you read in the book of Exodus, sanctify me in every forge, in every sexual act, that sacred potential which cleaves the womb. What cleaves the womb? In a very ordinary, of course, uh, sexual act, when the man ejaculates, the sperm cleaves the womb of the woman, the uterus, in order to create a life. But alchemically speaking, the Shakti potential cleaves the womb, but the spiritual womb that we have, which is the spinal medulla. That is, in alchemy, a womb where the fire rises and awakes what we call in Sanskrit Kundalini, or what Moses calls in uh, his writings the serpent of brass, because it's a fiery element that is the union of two, or the alloy of two forces, the man and the woman, in order to make brass. It's just a symbol. So that is the force that climbs the womb, the spinal medulla, in order to uh, transmute it 
in a sense, slave of Malkut. Because we, physically speaking, our physicality is called the woman. Whether we are men or, or woman, we are, physically speaking, female. And that female is a slave of the forces of nature. But we have, in our sexuality, in our physicality, that sexually or sexual potency, called a Shakti potential of the solar light. If we transmute it, that energy will climb. But not only related with sex, but also, as we read here, uh, related with behema, which is the force that we have here in the solar plex the animal force, the solar force of behema. Behemoth is also called in plural. And of course, the forces of, of the archetype of Israel are the ones that feed themselves with that mana when we know how to transmute the sexual energy. In that way is how we understand what the Sohar states about the 72 divine names of yod he vav -Heh. In many other lectures, we explain how every world of Kabbalah uh, represents the letters of the holy name of God. Yod is Hatziluth, yod he is Bria, yod he vav is Yetzirah, and yod he vav -He is Malkut, or Asya. By knowing that, in making the additions of the value of the letters, is how we have the 72 names of God, which is synthesized in the number 9, which is Yesod, the sexual energy again. So everything points to that Yad, to that sexual force that we have in the sexual organs, that we have to sanctify. Because if we look for God, don't look at outside. God is the creator. And that God is energy. It's a force. Within each one of us and also outside. It's everywhere. If we want to take advantage of that force, then we can do it by learning alchemy. These explanations are precisely uh, important in order to comprehend the 12th precept, which is precisely the next one after the precepts that we explain in a former lecture. You see there, according to the book of Tarot, or Torah, the hanged man is a twelfth. So, the twelfth precept concerns the, the tithes, the tens, the yards, or seeds on fruit trees, as it is written. And the haya, that means life, that is the yad the soul of Bina, the Holy Spirit, the soul of the Mercury, or Shakti potential of every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding semen or butte Mercury, Zera in Hebrew, seed. To you it shall be for food. Genesis 1 verse 29. When you read this literally, without the alchemical explanation, you might think, oh, that means if I am in this physical world, according to this book, I am uh, willing to eat, you know, from the fruits of the tree and to feed my physicality. But that's good, but uh, it doesn't need to be written. Yeah. There are many animals that do it. They don't know how to read, they don't even have an idea what we're talking about here, right? Monkeys do it. But obviously, alchemically, we are addressing the zera, the seed. Remember that, alchemically speaking, we are trees. 
The Bible talks these three physicalities of us. Pleasant to the sight. But there are two trees inside these trees of, that are pleasant to the sight that we always talk about. The tree of life, which represents the spinal medulla, and the tree of good and evil, which are the sexual organs. Those are the two trees that we have to take care of that this commandment is addressing. This means that from the seed of those two trees, you can eat. But unfortunately, people that do not know alchemy, they don't eat from those trees. They don't know how to put in activity the chakras, for instance, which are in the spinal column, in order to eat the solar light and to awake other senses and to comprehend life. And when they go to the sexual act, instead of transmuting as an alchemist, the sexual energy, they just enjoy reaching the orgasm of animals. In that way, Christians, Jewish, I mean Jews, uh, Muslims, Brahmins, Buddhists, will never awake their consciousness because that is the food of the soul, which in alchemy in the Bible is called Israel. We want to feed Israel inside of us. We have to eat that seed. And to eat that seed means to transmute it. Not like animals eat it. Because it is written that when you eat like an animal from those trees, you will die. This is what the book Genesis states. In other words, though it is unlawful, according to the cosmic common trogocratic law, to keep what is consecrated to me, the ains of ore, I permit you to eat, better said, to sexually transmute of the tenth, the yad, or shakti potential, of the products of the earth, your physicality, whether of grains, semen, or of the trees of life and knowledge, in order that they may serve as a spiritual food to you, better said, to your consciousness, and not to future generations. In other words, not to fornication. Because people utilize the sexual force just to multiply as animals. Therefore, the tithe, the tenth, the yod, becomes a practical and necessary complement of the dynamic principle which emanates from the profound study of the Tenth Commandment. In other words, you shall not covet your neighbor's good. That's the Tenth Commandment. We must consider the mysterious Yad, which is hidden in the middle of the central delta of the sanctuary of our being, which is a central nervous system as a fountain, spring, and a spiritual providence of all the interior and divine centers of our Haya, life. Behold here the twelfth arcanum of the Torah, or Tarot. Behold here the union of the cross with the triangle. Behold here sexual magic. Behold here the realized work, the living human being that does not touch the earth, Malkut, but only with the thought, Samael on the or. So in other words, in order not to touch the earth, but only with your thought, in the very sexual act, you have to be very gentle and control the mind, and to transmute that to your brain, to your head. So then, if you transmute the yad, the shakti potential of your sexual energy to your head, you are touching the earth only with your thought. That's the alchemical meaning of it. Without spilling a single drop, 
of your sexual force. Therefore, in the sexual act, alchemical copulation, shall the ish, the yad, the tide, the shakti potential of the fire, esh, leave ja, his father and his mother, sperm and ovum, their physical receptacles, and up along the spinal column shall the yad, the tithe, open the womb, the spine, and cleave to the head as hey or isha, the kundalini, the serpent of brass, his wife, and they, ish and isha, the fire of Jah, Ava and Aima Elohim, shall be one fire in the bath of husband and wife. That is, in the spinal medulla of the hay, their flesh, their physicality. We just unveil Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, for alchemists. So the twelfth precept is to first bring up through your spine, by means of sexual alchemy, the shakti potential of the fruits of that, the tree of knowledge. And thereafter, give away the light, that is the fruits of haim, the tree of life. In all areas of our life, as a true blessing for all humanity, Thus, in the evening, we perform the positive sexual connection of Jah with our Hava for such an alchemical transmutation. Will be the seed given forth for the rest of the day, given that the evening and the morning are one day. Therefore, after it says, uh, well, I want to read the, uh, the Psalm 19, verse 2. It says, Day after day, utter a speech, and night after night, experience knowledge. This is what Psalm says. This is an alchemical statement. In Kabbalah, Ratzon le Kabel means to receive. This is what we do. When we go into the sexual act night after night, you see, this is something very important here. Experience. The word experience is written Yod, Het, Vav, He, which is written Yod, Hava. In other words, it says, night after night, experience, knowledge. And what is knowledge? The tree of good and evil is knowledge, which is sex. Experience that. And during the day, day after day, after a speech, it's what I'm doing. And that is called rasan le tet. The will to give. Because we learn, kabel, to receive. But if you receive and receive it, don't give, there is not a harmony there. That's why I'm giving this. I need to give it. This is raison le tête, will to give. But in the night, I am willing to receive with my chava, which means with my physicality, because that's chava as well. And also the sexual organ is called chava, Eve, either in the female or male. So husband and wife during the night, they receive the tenth, the tithe. That belongs to God. Because according to the cosmic common autocratic law, everything that descends from above, from the ain't so forth, the solar absolute, return. Has to return. That's a cycle. That's called trogo auto egocratic cosmic common. 
to, re to give and to receive, to give and to receive. And all the universe is like that, in order to sustain the life of the universe. So our physicality does that. We receive through the mouth, we receive through the nose, impressions through the senses. We feel our physicality with sexual force. And mechanically speaking, our body returns that or gives to the earth, and the earth returns that to the sun, to the solar absolute. And that is how the universe sustains, alchemically speaking. So the energy, that energy, that solar light that we are talking, that is the Yad, belongs to the light, to the ends of all. But the commandment says, take for you the ten. The tenth. What is the tenth? Oh, my body was say, oh, the ten percent. Only the ten percent? No. Take the Yad. That's the tenth letter. Mm -hmm. for you to enlighten yourself. And that is in the sexual organ, in your yad. Now, let us continue with this <coughs> in the next graphic. We find uh, Jesus with Mary, his mother, and with John, his disciple. That relates to this 12. Because this is how we learn how to uh, accomplish with certain steps of the stations of the cross. One of those stations of the cross is when uh, Jesus talked to his mother and to his disciple. But let us read. So, this is how Adam, our brain, will know Hava, our sex, his wife, who will say, I have gotten an ish. That, that word ish is translated as male in Hebrew. Aya, the Shakti potential of the fire, ish, from Yod He Vav He, Genesis 4.1. This is how alchemically we interpret this too. When Chava says, I am begotten and a man from God, this is how it's said, or oh, a man from the Lord. This means that the alchemists that perform this eventually will create Isaac in himself from the Lord. Thus, by not ejaculating the life fire of Jah, his light, will bloom in our heart as wisdom and knowledge. This wisdom and knowledge is Johannes Ra, Chava, or Eve's son, Eve's son. The outcome of our sublimated Haya, or soul of the Mercury, that through sexual alchemy we took from the sexual seed, our brute Mercury. Therefore, when Joshua, the Shin, the fire of Chochmah, saw his mother, Aima Elohim in that, and his disciple, the human soul, standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Isha, which means woman, fiery woman, behold thy son in Tifereth. The human soul. Then he said to his disciple, Behold thy mother, Elayam, the sea goddess, in that. And from that hour, that disciple, or Bodhisattva, took her, the woman serpent, unto his own heart. John chapter 19, verse 26, 27. That's the mystery, precisely, of that saying on the cross, of Master Jesus. In, the, in Christianity, they talk about the 14 steps of the cross. And we explain that the cross is a vertical uh, beam is the phallus, and the horizontal is the vagina. United both, those are the 14 steps of alchemy between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. 
precepts that in the book of Zohar explains in different different manner. But we place that there in order to show you that it's also in the Gospels. A divine mother, uh, uh, Mary or Miriam, as we said in Hebrew, represents Elayam, the goddess of the sea. And even in this day and age, they uh, worship the mother of Jesus as the virgin of Carmel, the virgin of the sea. Right. In order to point alchemically, that is representing the female aspect of the creative forces of God, Ela Jam in Hebrew, which is precisely the sea goddess. And that when the initiate reaches the fifth initiation, which is John, Johanan, or Johannes, and he chooses to follow the direct path, then the Lord says, Behold your mother, the free woman. And to the woman says, Behold our son, because Christ incarnates in the human soul and becomes one with John. This is a mystery of alchemy that we had to learn in those precepts. Now, let us enter into the study of the 13th precept. The 13th precept relates to the alchemical work of redemption or purchase, purchase of the firstborn Israel whose archetypes are in bondage in Mizraim, Egypt and thus making his life assured by connecting them to Tifereth through Haya, the power of Otzhaim, tree of life. For there are two angels, one of which is the Lord of life, Haya, the other the Lord of death, Maveth, always hovering near and about at the time of birth of any master of fifth degree. When the Keter of a man, as Moses, redeems his child, Israel, from the power of the second death, by means of the alchemical ritual, ritual of life and death, that implies the separation of the consciousness from the process of the second death. Then it, the second death, has no power or influence over the life of Israel's archetypes, his offspring. Thus, when an alchemist redeems his consciousness, he redeems it from Klipoth and takes it out of death's control. This is the esoteric meaning of the words. And Elohim saw everything that he, as a share or who, had made through Asia or Ma, the mother. And behold, it was very good. And Yehi the evening, and Yehi the morning, the sixth day. The word good, Tob, designates. Aur, or better said, forgive me, Od, the angel, Lord of life. The word Meod, very in Hebrew, that's his name, the angel, Lord of death, which is Ob. By redemption, the one Od, Chai is strengthened. The other of, muth, which is death, enfeebled, and has, as we have just said, no longer power over the child, which is Israel, so hard. So this 13th precept is related with death and life. When we talk about ob and od, in the ordinary uh, alchemical point of view, we read that, or we wrote that with the letter Ayin. 
But here is written with the letter Aleph because it represents the two polarities of that which reaches the fifth initiation of major mysteries. Ob and Od, <clears throat> which is uh, written in that way, the word uh, Tob, which represents good, is Od, and Meod is evil. But here, as we read, are represented by two angels, life and death, that follow the one that enters, enters into the direct path, which is death, the letter Mem, the 13th precept. That's why uh, there are many superstitions about the number 13, because it relates to death. But for the initiate that follow this path, 13 is a very good number. Because every time that we kill or we are killed, initiatically speaking, in the internal planes, a birth of a virtue, of a power in the consciousness is attained. In all of the books, religious books, you find, for instance, in the Bible, how David kills ten thousands and in Saul, one thousands and all the wars that you find also in the uh, book of uh, Mahabharata, for instance, in India, and uh, among the Muslims in the writings. Uh, how do you call that book? Quran. The Quran, right? The annihilation, the killing of all the unbelievers, unloyal ones. Those are not outside. Alchemically speaking, they are inside of us. All those animal aspects that we had to annihilate, we had to kill them. But inside, through alchemy, by knowing how to work with the forces of fire that we explain in different lectures. Here, in the next uh, graphic, we find a better uh, explanation about the name Israel in order to understand what is of and odd, because the word Aleph, Vav, Dalet, Odd, in Hebrew means ember. It's the right side. But Ob, Aleph, Vav, Bet, means witchcraft, sorcery, which is associated with evil. And these are the two serpents. Odd and Ob. It is written that the serpent that tempted Eve, the sexual organ, was Ob, witchcraft, sorcery. Hmm? which is lunar force that relates to procreation. So this is how many alchemists are tempted through procreation, especially through the female body, the woman. Naturally, by nature, the woman wants to fulfill her destiny as being a mother. And not only her mind works in that, all of his physicality of his being wants that. And when she controls that as Madame Blavatsky or Joan of Arc, he transmutes that yad and becomes a master. And the man, well, he has to fight also with his own physicality, the desire of being a father. She is nothing bad with it, but in alchemy, you have to dedicate all your tithes, 10% of all the income that you receive from the universe in nature to your God. You see that? You understand that? All the income, all the energy that you receive from nature, universe, you have to give it to God. 10% means the Yad. Simple as that. We read... In Asiluth, the world of archetypes, the world of becoming, the firstborn son Israel, the first letter, the Yad, is within which is the Shin 
or Shakti potential of Ra. Ra is the solar light, the fire, the ends of Aor, that manifests through El, Keter, in Bria, the world of creation, and in Yasira, the world of formation. It hovers with El, which is Hesed, Abraham, above Yasad, in order to ultimately work with the waters of life and death in Asia. Though the fire of Yod from Ra protects the El of all alchemists who are born and dead through these sexual alchemical precepts. When I say they are born and dead, doesn't mean physically speaking, we're talking alchemically. When you are transmuting that Yod, that sexual potential, you are being born spiritually in the light because only the sexual energy can give birth. But if you apply the sexual force in order to annihilate your uh, defects and biases, you are also dying. And that is precisely uh, the two forces that enter into activity and any master that enter the fifth initiation. is mandatory to work with death. If you're on the spiral, you work little by little, but you're on the direct path, you work very often. You have to be clean. And that's precisely what Moses found in the previous graphic. He found before, uh, before his inner God, he sees two angels, one of life and the other death, to work with it, to annihilate all that witchcraft that we have within. Just called Ob. In order to understand this, we wrote, wherever in the scripture the word Yehi, which means becoming, is used, it addresses the divine light, Ehe Ye, which is Keter, the ancient of days. Both within Hesed, the innermost of this word, world, and the logos of the world of becoming, Atsiluth. So Yehi, the divine light and splendor, Tifereth, though refracted and reflected by the Sephiroth, is only one and the same. In other words, that Yehi is also the letter Yad. Now you see, for instance, how the, the word Yehi is uh, written is with two Yads, right? The two jobs represents the man and the woman. And the hay is their physicality. Why not two hays in order to represent the man and the woman? Because that happens when they are in one oneself. They are united sexually. The one hay, not two. One hay. Well, we would say one hit would be better. But the word is yehi with two yads. One is a man and the other is a woman and the letter he is a sexual act. One single physicality. When men and women are in a sexual act, they are not two, they are only one. Therefore, by this act of redemption, that is, by this psychological alchemical death, odd the ultraviolet light is strengthened and all of the infrared light is weakened. Through psychological death, one purchases solar light for oneself. As has been mentioned, so that the clipotic lunar light leaves the alchemists alone and does not cling to him anymore. And Elohim called the light day, and Yehi the evening, and Yehi the morning, the first light day. It means that when you annihilate completely your whole ego, there is no problem here to learn how to transmute. Because you now have to learn how to transmute your sexual energy, because you have a lot of orb. I mean, a lot of witches, sorcerers, demons within. People are always thinking that all of those creatures that uh, the Bible talks about 
and like the Quran talks about and other books, sacred books talk about, about demons and about witches, sorcerers at our side. Yeah, we understand that. There are a lot of people that practice that. But when the Bible and other books talks about that, it's addressing your defects, your vices. Because all of us had that within, very alive. And this is uh, what we learn in these uh, alchemical precepts. Some people in this uh, life are very, uh, we will say, uh, trying to be saintly, holy, and don't want to hear about that, and know about other people that practice witchcraft. But let me tell you, all of us here have that longing of knowing about the occult or hidden mysteries of life and death. In other lives, when you didn't hear this type of precepts explained as it is explained now, you are entering into witchcraft, into sorcery, trying to experience through that, but it's hidden. And without knowing, you were practicing witchcraft, medianism, sorcery. Now you are not doing it. But if you delve into your psyche, you will discover certain egos that you have that relate to that. That's why Master Samael on the Or states, it is funny to hear some Gnostics accusing others of being black magicians. When they have the black magician inside of them, anyone that has ego is black. Only those that have no ego are white like the light. That's very, very rare to find in this uh, day and age. That's why in the next graphic, we wrote a quotation. Uh, from the Master Samael on the Or. We find this uh, beautiful picture of Dali and his Christ. And above it, we said, we wrote, this is how the alchemist dies on the alchemical cross. But below there, you see the alchemist in the sexual act, in the what we call British Pact of Fire, because that fire is in the sexual act, and this is where you have to control and to steal the fire from the devil or the Shakti potential from your physicality, which is the devil in yourself. The eye is the demon that we carry within. Concerning this affirmation, we can say that the work of the dissolution of the eye is really the work with the demon. This work is very difficult. When we work with the demon, tenebrous entities usually launch terrible attacks against us. This is really the path of the astute man, the famous fourth path, the path of Tao. The origin of the sinful eye lies in lust. The ego, Satan, is subject to the law of eternal return of all things. It returns to new wounds in order to satisfy desires in each one of his lives. The I repeats the same dramas, the same errors. The I complicates itself over time, each time becoming more and more perverse. Satan's death is done through the alchemical cross. The Satan that we carry within is composed of atoms of the secret enemy. Satan has a beginning. Satan has an end. We need to dissolve Satan in order to return to the inner star that has always a smile upon us. This is the true final liberation. Only by dissolving the I through the alchemical cross, we can attain absolute liberation. Samael on the or. And that is the 13th uh, precept. Or the 13th step of the cross. It says, the Lord dies on the cross.
Here we find Abraham in relation with this uh, type of annihilation that we were talking about. Let us read what the Sohar states. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And Yehi the evening is Isaac, and Yehi the morning, Abraham, the day one. The Sohar states, the light emanating from the divine and so forth is expressed in the word Bereshith. Better said, Beratayish, of which the first part, Bra, Bera, contains the initial letters of the name Abraham, he said, to which a scripture refers. And Yodhava appeared to Abraham as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the light of the day, of the light of the day, the esoteric meaning of which is as follows. When Abraham created Isaac, he sat at the door of his tent, that is, at the gate of Da'at, that separates the higher and lower worlds, symbolized by the letter Aleph. He felt the great heat of the light, day, that is. He became mentally and spiritually enlightened by the divine light of Keter, the first Logos. The light of Chokhmah, the second Logos, referred to Taish, the second part of Bereshith, that was beheld by Isaac when in the cool of the evening, when the sun of midnight was going down, he prayed for the coming of this light into Malkut, as it is written. And Isaac, Keburah, went out to meditate in the field at the evening. So in the initiation of alchemy, you see there, when Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, that's the meaning of the working of the two lights. Because in the book of Genesis, we always talk about, and the evening and the morning was the first day and the second day, etc. Two lights. So Abraham, in this case, which is in the right side of the tree of life, represents the day, the light of the day. And you see here, fine in Hebrew written, it's written say the, the three letters, Bet, Resh, Aleph, are the letters that hide the name Abraham, or the word Bereshith, that is translated in the Bible as Genesis. And the other part of Bereshith is pointing at this animal. Taish is how you say it in Hebrew. Taish can be a goat, could be a ram. If you remember the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac when he was going to do it, then the angel stopped him and says, there is an animal for sacrifice and respect the life of your son, which is Geburah, you see, related with the first initiation, the very first initiation of Mayor Mysteries, in which the, you see the dilemma you receive an initiation, but you are not willing, worth, or worthiest, worthiest of receiving that physically, because you have still defects, vices, and errors. So Abraham has to sacrifice that, send it to Geburah. But instead of doing that sacrifice and fulfilling the karma, which should be death physically, to your physical body, you find the, the ram, which means by annihilating your ego, you are overcoming your physical death because you still need to walk on the path of sanctity or realization. So that's why this animal 
appears not only in that episode of the Bible, but in many others. How the ram or the goat has to be sacrificed, but that symbolizes the fire. Taish, as you see there, relates to the forces of Malkut. <coughs> the letter Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The letter Yad is the Shakti potential. And the letter Shin represents the fire. So the sacrifice of fire is the way in which we are explaining here through chastity. You transmute your sexual energy through chastity. You annihilate your ego. And you become righteous. And then you understand that that animal ram, which is the symbol of Aries, symbolizes fire. And if he's a goat, that goat is the symbol of Capricorn, which is the house of Saturn, which is death. So all of that points alchemical work that we had to perform in order for karma to be forgiven. Why karma? Because Isaac represents Gebura. And Gebura is the law, is karma. So you have to pay what you owe. But by sacrificing your animality in the sexual act. If you reach the spasm of the orgasm, you are not sacrificing your animality. But when you do it, you are sacrificing the lamb. You are sacrificing the ram or the goat. And by annihilating the ego, you are doing it as well. Let us not fall into the wrong interpretation of thinking that by sacrificing an ordinary lamb or, or ram or goat, you will receive pardon of your karma. Because there are still people that think that and do those sacrifices. But the ego is still alive. Maybe you can appease the forces of nature. But you are still under the law of karma. And only by performing this sacrifice, alchemically speaking, we are out of the law. Because the virtues, peace, love, faith, are under the superior laws, not under the law of karma. The law of karma is not going to punish you because you are uh, charitable. But only if you are stealing, then the law falls in you. So annihilate the ego of stealing. And for that you need to comprehend to annihilate your ego in order to sacrifice the fire for that. Because that fire of the ram, which is Samael, in other words, Arius, represents the fire that you sacrifice for your own sins. When you accumulate it. Because if you are not accumulating, saving that fire, how is that fire of Christ going to annihilate your egos? Lamb of God that erases the sins of the world. This is one of the prayers in Christianity. But that lamb is fire. It's not an innocent animal. And that fire is Christ. It's Inri. That if we accumulate it in us and we apply it, and then he erases our sins of our own particular individual world. Let us now enter into the mystery of the 14 precept, which is last. Very important. The 14 precept <coughs> relates, of course, with the Sabbath. Shabbat, Sabbath day is the seventh day, you know that. Today is Saturn. It's the seventh day of the week, literally speaking. But when you count the Sephiroth from Hesed, which is Abraham, and these seven Sephiroth are related to the true man. 
Hesed is one, Gebura is two, Tiferes is three, Netzah is four, Hor is five, Yesod is six, and Malkut is seven. Counting from above to below. We can say, oh, we are the first one, and Hesed is the seventh. Sometimes we say that, the physical body and up to the spirit. But really, the spirit was created first. We were created like a few years ago, right? In the sexual act, obviously, right? But this is the seventh. So when we read about the seventh day, talking about the seventh body, you are talking about your physicality again, you see. The priests of alchemy go directly to your physicality. But here, in relation with the Sabbath, which means with the practice of sexual alchemy directly. Talking in a general way in the Orthodox Judaism. Those that follow the strict Judaism, according to tradition, they perform the sexual act only Friday night, which is the evening of Saturday. Because when Saturday, the light of Saturday, the sun is rising there and shining, that is the morning of Saturday. This is what the Bible said. The evening and the morning was the first day. That's why sometimes you hear the siren here when the sun is down completely. And you hear the siren in the city of New York. Why? It's because it was announcing that the sun is going down. So the evening of Saturday begins. That will end, of course. Today is Saturday. The day of Saturday, the morning, will finish until the sun sets again. That is what we call Sabbath, uh, in general speaking, in, in the days. But we are going to talk about that alchemically, in order for you to understand all of these symbols that we read in the Bible. The 14th precept has respect to rest. Our sexual alchemical work on the down of the Sabbath day, as did Elohim, because on this, Venus Elohim rested his work of creation, as it is written. His mouth is not sweet, yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. O daughters of Jerusalem, son of sons of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. And on this seventh light day, Elohim finished his work, which he had made, and he rested on this, Zain and Hey, the Shabbat, which also means Shabbat, the daughter. The seven light day, Saturnian light or Saturnian day, from all of his work which he, Asher, had made through Zain in He, which is Asya, Malkut. And Elohim blessed Zain, the seven light or Saturnian day, and made it holy, because on this, Zain and He, Asia, the seven light, the Saturnian light, he rested to perform all of his work which he, as Asher, had created and made in Asia. Genesis 2, verse 2 and 3. You see, we just unveil it and in put in quotations what it means. What is Zain? Zain is this woman here. Zain is the physicality. It's hey. And Zain is the seventh letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The first is Yad, the second is Bet, the third is Gimel, the fourth is Dalet, the fifth is uh, hey, 
The six is Vav. And the seven? Zain. These letters Zain and Vav look alike, but they are different. But I told you that the letter He represents also the physicality. That's why, you know, when you study the Hebrew alphabet, then you put all the puzzles, all the parts of the puzzle in, 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 in action. We explained that the letter He of the holy name, yod He vav He is a physicality. And the seven body, according to the true man, of the seven lower sephiroth, is Malkut. So if we put the letter Zain and the letter He together, we are pointing directly to the physicality, alchemically speaking. And together, the letter Zain and the letter He reads this, you see, in Hebrew, this. So when you read, you read in Hebrew, this, immediately you point, oh, alchemically, they are pointing to my seventh part of me, which is my physicality, my, my hey, alchemically speaking. So when you read that beautiful son of, uh, of Solomon, he's addressing the physicality, which in this case is a feminine aspect in which Chesed comes and begat. You know, begets something. When you are chemically work in yourself, you have to concentrate in your God, in your Chesed, in your Abraham, in your innermost, to work in your physicality. And that is what the swan represents in that mythological Greek Roman story. Leda in the, in, the, in, the, in the swan. Leda is the femininity, the physicality of us, and the swan is the Holy Spirit. In other words, that me related to the same statement that says that the angel Gabriel said to Miriam, or Mary, the mother of Jesus, you don't know any man, but the Holy Spirit will visit you and will engender inside of your womb a son. And his name will be Yeshua, Jesus. Well, the swan or the, or the white dove represents the forces of Keter descending through Hesed. And working in your physicality. And that's why Solomon says, right? His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. The Holy Spirit. This is my beloved said the Holy Spirit, right? This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Who are the daughters of Jerusalem? The daughters are the female, physicalities, man or woman, of the alchemical work, Jerusalem. When you read that, you say, oh, this is talking about alchemy here directly to the sanctity of, of sex. And of course, explains the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, how the Lord, Jehovah Elohim, who is the swan, who is the Holy Spirit, who is Bina, in the tree of life, made everything on the seventh day. He rested on the seventh day. It's like asking, if you ask your dad, Dad, how do you uh, created me? And your dad will say, oh, I rested on the seventh day in my physicality. But not only me, your mother too. In the sexual act, I was resting on my physicality and she also. And through that sexual union, we created you on the seventh day. Recall, of course, in, in the very lower level. But of course, this is called, we are talking about chastity here. But we created through the seventh body because the physical body of my physical father is the seventh body of his acceptable constitution. And my mother, the seventh body of her 
acceptable constitution. Together, what did they make? Seven and seven in the sexual act. What did they make? Fourteen. You see? That's why there are 14 precepts. They are not uh, uh, 12, 13. It's 14. Because the man is 7 and the woman is 7. Together, 14. And this is how God rested on the 7th. In order to make all which is written in the book of Genesis. This precept is subdivided into two others. One enjoined rest, that is to avoid the orgasm when alchemically resting on this, Shabbat, light. The other teaching us to keep it holy. The rules to follow of alchemy. Let us go into the other chapter of Zohar. Concerning resting our sexual alchemical work on the Sabbath, the seventh body, Malkut, our physicality, we have already said it was ordained because Asher, the Holy Spirit, the divine being, rested on Asia, Hava, Eve, in order to do his work, which he then finished. Now let us read the following explanation that we wrote. However, when in the continent Mu, Yodhava Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and close up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which Jodhava Elohim had taken from Adam, made he a woman, and brought her unto Adam. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Very clear. Then, the first sexual alchemical work on the Sabbath commenced between man and woman. But there were certain creatures, demons from other realms, who had not received bodies in which to incarnate. The question may here arise, could not the Holy One have retarded among animal souls, the approach of a sexual alchemical work on the Sabbath, and thus have provided them, these demons, with physical sheaths or bodies? The truth is, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, sex, had excited them to revolt against chastity, even before embodiment, through their great lustful desire to descend into the world of Malkut, or onto the earth, and make themselves lords and masters thereof. The Holy One then divided the animal souls into two classes, of which he placed one, the good, the chaste, the right, the righteous, the sadic, by the tree of life, and the other, the bad, the fornicator, the left, the unrighteous, by the tree of good and evil. While intending in Lemuria, upon providing for the former with bodily forms. The initiation of the sexual alchemical work on the seventh day, Sabbath day, dawned, and thus the work for providing them with physical shields or bodies was interrupted and suspended. So we are talking here about the first time when, the, when humanity was divided, you see I was explained there, in two sexes. Because in the beginning, humanity was androgynous. Two sexes in one body. But when we're divided, here's the problem. This animal soul had to be taught how to transmute the sexual energy. 
In other words, to enter into the, mis the mysteries of the Sabbath, which is the seven body. How to procreate through the Sabbath in the 14 precepts without reaching orgasm. And when that happened, obviously, from other cosmic rounds, there were certain demons floating in the atmosphere, as Matthew Samael Onveor explains in his books, that they wanted also physical bodies. But then he saw, if we give physical bodies to these demons, they will ruin the Sabbath, because they don't want to transmute. They were just excited to see that humanity was divided into sexes, and they were seeing women and wanted them lustfully speaking. So then uh, the Sabbath uh, day started and they were pushed aside in order not to ruin procreation or, or, or the goal, the plan of the solar absolute, which is create, to create solar men of those souls, animal souls, that were entering into the physical aspect of this. Here, in the next graphic, <coughs> we found this uh, beautiful graphic of Shiva, the destroyer of demons, and how Shiva is the one that, with the force of the solar absolute, which is the Shakti potential, begins always in the world of creation, the mysteries of the Sabbath, Remember that Shiva, Bina, the Holy Spirit, is the one that represented two forces, male and female, in a sexual act. The Zohar states, if these lustful, rebellious, and ambitious demon, demonic lunar spirits from other cosmic realms had acquired bodies, then the divine solar objective of the world will not have continued to exist even for a moment. The Holy One had, however, provided a remedy, a remedy against this prospective catastrophe by hasting on the animal souls the coming of the sexual and chemical work on the Sabbath. And therefore, the world exists and continues with a divine solar objective. While those wicked, lustful spirits or demons thought of doing by means of their orgasmic animal procreation of and filling the world with their lustful demonic offspring was accomplished by Hesed, Abraham, or those good spirits or monads by the tree of life, who from the night, from their left side of the first sexual or chemical work on the Sabbath, discharged this duty through chastity. In other words, in that time, the Hesed, the Abraham, or the innermost of those souls, learned how to procreate without the orgasm. At that time, they didn't have any pain and deliverance or, or childbirth because we're not engendered with lust. So that is what it says, Abraham, he said, did that. And this is how Lemuria multiplied through chastity. It's called the power of uh, Kriya and will. This is why the wise and they, the alchemists, who understand, understand sexual alchemy, restrict their connubial relationships to the secondary light in the day or down of the Sabbath, that is, to Hava, El Ayam Bina, so that the wicked spirits from Klipoth may recognize how inferior they are to those who, willest incarnated, are able to discharge marital duties through chastity. It is these wicked spirits who, from Klipoth, go forth in their hordes throughout the world of Malkut, with the hope of surprising any alchemist who through the orgasm violates and infringes the esoteric injunction respecting the conjugal act of chastity. 
the offspring of which becomes afflicted with epilepsy. That is to say, afflicted with a disorder in the central nervous system of their tree of life, characterized by the loss of divine consciousness. Through becoming obsessed by Lilith, the great mother of demons, who by means of the orgasm kills and destroys Cupid, Eros, and Ael, the child of Shiva, the Holy Spirit, or true chaste love between spouses, so hard. So that's why every Friday night, which is related to this secondary light that we are talking about, all these witches' Sabbath are very active, followers of Lilith. And they always enjoy and send many attackers, sexually attackers, to those that are performing their sexual chastity in order to force them to fornicate. So you have to be aware always, and that's why we always teach different conjurations and protections in order to protect yourself from those influences when you start doing this chase work for your own soul. Because these uh, elements are still active, especially in this day and age, where there are many followers of Lilith that worship fornication, worship adultery, and make a big thing of it. And you know that. Here we are teaching this path of us that, are, of course, we are not angels, but we are trying to get rid of that and we enter into the path of chastity. But uh, most of humanity are following the other path, the broad path that goes into the abyss, and we, that is represented by Lilith, which is precisely the mother of fornication and, uh, and adultery. Let us continue with the Sabbath. As soon as, however, the Sabbath day, the light of Saturn rises or begins to rise up in the spine, and whilst it endures, these wicked spirits becoming filled with terror fly quickly away and hide themselves with the exception of one of them, named a Simon. You see how we spell it that alchemically? Who with Lilith and his lustful attendants terminates the power of any alchemist. He is authorized to go through the world of Yasad in order to seek and find out fornicators and adulterers or transgressors of the law related to conjugal alchemical practice. That is to say, those who exchange their divine tithes for the pleasures of the flesh. When the night, however, has passed, he is obliged to go and hide himself in the great abyss of, abyss of darkness. The sexual alchemical Sabbath ended. Hosts of lustful demons reappear in the world, and therefore, to guard off and be proof against the, their evil influence, and nullify their power, the reading of the Psalm 91 has been enjoined. In other words, this reading of the 91st or 91 Psalm relates to the works that we are doing here. As you can see there, Delilah has the name the Lilith, which is the dark forces of the light that eventually defeated Samson, that is Shemshon. Shemesh Aum, the strength, the virility of the sun, the solar light. In other words, when you are transmuting your sexual energy, your solar force, which is in your yad and your seed, your semen and oven, Shemesh, the light of the sun, because Shemesh means sun in Hebrew, is growing in you. Your virility, Aum. Shemesh Aun 
contracted is Shemshan, Samson. And that was the strength of Samson that finally he revealed to Lilith. So, of course, in the sexual act, Samson ejaculated his strength, and this is how he lost his chastity, his power, his strength. And uh, Asimon, who is the only one that you say that is free to go? Well, it's your own lust. Because you conjure here, you conjure there, you protect yourself of the attack of any other forces that can force you to fornicate. Okay, you are free, good. Practice your alchemy. But there is one there that uh, you didn't conjure and is always there and will be with you. And it's your lust. And that's precisely the one that you have to be aware of. It. Samson, in the story of Delilah, he was destroying all his enemies and inside and outside he was very powerful. But he forgot his inner Asimon. Aun, as you see there. If, if this word Aun is uh, in the word of Samson. You see? Samson. And here is Asimon. We will say this is the contrary. The lust. is the one that is always there. And with all the egos of Lilith, attacked. So be aware of that. Be always aware that the worst enemy that you will find in the path of chastity is yourself. Is your ego. It's not outside. It's inside of you. So anytime you start, be aware of that. Because if you don't, uh, if you forget that, and then the, your chastity will be cut by your own lilies, your own darkness. And then the, you will be blind. You won't see anymore the light of the Lord. Pardon? To your pituitary and, and uh, pineal gland. And your enemies, your egos, will take care of you. And you will, in the middle, again, of samsara. Until you recuperate your strength. Here we find Eros in Psyche. In the moment when they are with Zeus, the father of all the gods. Uh, this is the Psalm 91 that you can enjoy reading it in the Bible. Let us read about it. Whosoever dwells in that, the secret place of the Most High, will rest in the shadow of Shaddai. They will say of Yod Haba, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover me with his feathers under his wings. I will take refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror of Laila, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your left side, 
and 10,000 are your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have said, Yod Chava is my refuge, and have made of the Most High your dwelling place. No evil shall happen to you, neither shall any plague come near you, near your dwelling. For he will put his angels in charge of you, to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, so that you won't dash your foot against a stone. Yesod. You will tread on the lion and cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent underfoot, because he has set his love on me. Therefore, I will deliver him, I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. I will satisfy him with long life and show him my salvation. Psalm 91. The next graphic we read. As soon as the lustful demons observe the children of Israel, or alchemists, engaged in prayer, and the reading of it, and holding in their hands a cup of wine, and without spilling a single drop of it, they hurriedly rush away and disappear in deserts and solitary places within the infraconsciousness of our own psychological nature in which they make their dense and hidden places. May the Holy Grail, one, ever keep and preserve us by means of psychological death from the fornicators and their lustful, nauseous power and influence. Our masters and great teachers, their names and memories be ever blessed. And Monish us that there are three different ways by which a human may incur guilt and attract evil, either by invoking curses, meaning clipotic lights, maruts, upon himself through black tantra, by wastefully eating bread or crumbs upon the ground. Adama, our physicality, or better said, casting the mana, the yad, from heaven, be they ever so small as the sperm of any seed which is on the surface of all the earth. And also, at the conclusion of the sexual alchemical work on the Sabbath, by lighting a candle of passional fire, before first reading or reciting the psalm of sexual alchemical liturgy of separation, and by thus doing, causing the passional fires of Heena to be lightened before their time. There is in Heena a place reserved for those who break and profane the sexual alchemical work on the Sabbath, and who enjoy a respite from the fiery punishment Willis the Sabbath endures and vent their maledictions and curses on them, who light a passional candle before the prescribed time, saying, May God hurl thee in his fury and bring thee hither and thus be tossed about as a ball, so that thou becomes an object of shame and reprobation to thy kith and kindred so hard. Well, I think that that is uh, explained uh, with this beautiful uh, graphics that we've shown 
in relation with Master Jesus and the weddings of Cana. Remember that Master Jesus uh, taught in the weddings of Cana how to transmute the water into wine. And we talk plainly about water and the wine of the Spirit. And he says, don't spill a single drop from your cup. And of course, uh, that's also symbolized in the Eucharist. Because in the, in the wine and the bread is the substance, the yad of Christ. You eat it. As you eat it in the Eucharist, that is a symbol that you had to do it when you go to the tree of good and evil. It's a sexual act. Eat it too, like in the Eucharist. Transmute it. Don't reach the orgasm of the animals. Otherwise, you will lose. And you will be ejected. <clears throat> In order to uh, explain better this mystery of the Sabbath, we find in the Zohar also this uh, beautiful statement. Of course, it's longer, but we put in short what it means. You see, this uh, alchemical image there, call it solutio perfecta, means perfect solution, or it is written, ye shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. Ani yod chava. See, I, the Lord, is, trans is translated. That is called Leviticus 19, verse 30. These words plainly show that there are two Sabbaths. One heavenly, El Hayam. And one earthly, El Yam. Yet are they but one, Elohim. Both alike in their esoteric meaning. As you, as you see there. El Hayam Asher. What is this Asher? It means who? And we talk about that in other lectures. And also, me is who? But this Asher is hidden in the sacred name of Keter. Eheye Asher Eheye. And this Asher is the Holy Spirit. Bina, which is in between the Heye, Keter. And below you find Elayam, the cigarettes. Asia, which is Malkut, that we are talking about, which you've always other seen, which is the seventh body, Sabbath. So. Both are alike, they say. But there is another Sabbath, a third one, not mentioned in Scripture, and which was unhonored. This Sabbath said to the Holy One, Thou art my Maker, and I am called Sabbath. Now there is no day without night. Let there be a Sabbath night or eve as well as Sabbath day be kept. To which the Holy One replied, My child, Sabbath art thou, and Sabbath thou shalt be called. I will yet adorn thee with great honor and beauty. Then made he proclamation and said, Reverence my sanctuary. That is to say, the Sabbath, eve, sexual potency which is also to be reverenced and kept for the same, for the name of the Holy One, yod heh vav -He, is found alchemically active in the Holy Copulation in the Word of Yesod. So you see there the two symbols, the alchemical symbols there, the moon and the sun, the evening and the morning, the seventh day. This is how you see it. That's the, that, that's the Sabbath. But there is another one that is there. That is the outcome of your transmutation. 
something in you will be created, which is a symbol here of Eros, the angel of love. That is another Sabbath that comes from your seventh. And that is called Sabbath too, because it relates to each body, the same light which, which, which enlightens your physicality, vital, astral, mental, causal, beauty, and atomic body. That's what we call Christ. That's the outcome of the Sabbath. And that's why all the work is made on the Sabbath. And the water emerges from that Sabbath day, which is Miriam, Keter, I mean uh, Malkut, is Yeshua inside of us that will make the miracle. The sanctity of the Sabbath, as long as it is last, imposes absolute rest on the Saturnian light, both in the higher and lower worlds, during which the punishments of the wicked cease and their overlookers remain inactive until the children of Israel have finished reciting the words. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who separates the holy from the unholy. On him, however, who lights not his candle of passional fire, they invoke benedictions. Related this, we can read Genesis 27, verse 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 3, and Psalm 14, verse 1. God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grains and wine. Blessed be thou in the city and blessed be thou in the field, etc. Blessed is the man that considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Why do the descriptions use the words in time of trouble? In place of the evil day. Because the evil spirit then is able to obtain the mastery over the soul of a human. And then it is the Lord who will deliver him. By the word thou, poor, is meant the humble, sin, sick soul who repents of his lustful sins against the Holy One. Another and further interpretation of the words, the Lord shall deliver him in time of trouble, is that they allude to the Holy Sepulchre in the eighth initiation of Mayor Mysteries or that is related with the last judgment day, Zohar. So, as you see here in this graphic, you find Saturn. You see the scythe? This Saturn is the Lord of Sabbath, Bina, the Holy Spirit. And here we find his wife, Offering a child, right? According to mythology, he says that Saturn takes the child and what he does with it? He eats it, swallows it, right? This alchemically speaking is what happened in resurrection. When the initial has annihilated all the ego, Completely. And then the Divine Mother, represented there in the left, the wife of Saturn, which is Elayam, swallows his son, body after body. 
And then the son becomes a serpent, becomes a quetzal, coatl. So an individual that purifies himself in the Sabbath, annihilates all the ego. Meaning to purify yourself in the Sabbath means in the work of alchemy on your physicality. Because all the work that we have to do alchemically is on the Sabbath, on the seventh, Malkut. Now that's what alchemically represents to follow the Sabbath. So when you finish the annihilation, which is the work of Saturn on the Sabbath, as you see, is the Holy Sepulchre. Then you enter into the Holy Sepulchre. You are completely clean. The last thing that has to happen to you is to be swallowed by Saturn or to be swallowed by the Holy Spirit. And then the eagle, or the swan in this case, swallowed the serpent, the work of the serpent. And the individual becomes a quetzalcoatl, a feathered serpent. So that's the meaning. It doesn't mean that when you read the mythology, Saturn swallowing his children, doesn't mean that everybody is going to be swallowed. In the, in the mechanical way, of course, at the end, Saturn swallows all the children because he's death, right? But only one is not, is not swallowed, which is Zeus. I mean, the one that makes the work, performs and becomes a god. But in, in alchemy, the 14 precepts means that at the end you have to be swallowed by your own Saturn. Because first, the negative aspect, or we would say the feminine aspect of that Saturn, which is his wife, swallowed you. But the divine serpent doesn't eat anything filthy. She don't eat rubbish. If you have ego, she doesn't swallow you. You have to be completely clean. And this is precisely the man of the seventh day. When he's swallowed by Bina and becomes one with Bina. That is called resurrection from the Holy Sepulchre. That's the mystery or the last mystery of the step of the cross, the Holy Sepulchre. To reach that level is to be completely clean and very awakened. Master Jesus, of course, resurrected. He was swallowed by the Holy Spirit, by Saturn, and defeated death. Because death can only be defeated by death. And death is Saturn. Once Saturn swallows you, you are immortal. It's not why many people think of, if I believe in this, in the end I will be eternally in Eden. Right? No. It's an alchemical work. This is very specified. I'm talking in general here. But I, I can talk more in detail to those that make the work in order to, to be in eternal life. Because we are talking about the creator of life. If you study mythology, you will see that Saturn is the one that uh, relates to the creation in the beginning of the round. And to finish, <coughs> we read, there is in Hannah a place reserved for those who break the prof or profane the sexual or chemical holy work of, on the Sabbath. Now let me tell you that it is written there that if you light a candle before finishing the Sabbath, you enter into damnation, right? You might think, what is it to light a candle in Sabbath? doesn't mean that you are going to have to candle, uh, a candle in, in the traditional Sabbath, right? even though they follow that. But alchemically speaking, it means that after you finish your transmutation, your sexual, you, all the light of Saturn rises. But if your ego of lust is there and says, 
you know, why don't we perform again the sexual act? In light, the passional light, you know, of, of sex again immediately, that's to break the Holy Sabbath. You don't have to do it, you have to wait until the body recuperates again and is strong, sexually speaking. But there are many people that uh, are talking about an, an alchemy, right? That uh, are attempted to perform the sexual act after they finished. And they gave thank, uh, thanks to the God, whatever, finish it, and they go to rest. And immediately they are performing the sexual act immediately. And the physical body is already, there's nothing to transmute there. While they, they awake, the fires of Hena, of hell, in other words, lust. So, in order to perform the sexual act of transmutation, you had to feel your body, you had to feel that you have energy there. And you have energy, it's good. But of course, uh, in the common or the ordinary life, there are people that perform the sexual act, ordinary sexual act, even 15 times a day. And there are others that uh, in the Sabbath, they probably practice on Saturday, the sexual act as we see the Orthodox, but they fornicate. And obviously they also do more times. But they don't light an ordinary physical candle. Right? But they are doing it in themselves because they don't know. Right? So we have to learn alchemy in order to understand these uh, precepts that uh, you can uh, hear and study it with a PDF in order to comprehend more about these uh, uh, 14 precepts that we finished today or 14 steps or stations of the cross according to Christianity. Do we have questions? talks about how the, uh, sort of towards the end there, um, uh, while, intent, while intending, uh, in the upon uh, providing the formal and bodily forms, uh, the initiation of the sexual alchemical work of the seventh day of the, uh, uh, of the Sabbath uh, dawn, um, what, is, what is that talking about there? Does that mean that the, uh, they intended to give these demons bodies and then the, um, they, they said, oh wait, never mind? Well, you have to understand that uh, in every cosmic day, there's always a remnant yes. or initiates from other cosmic days before, around. Like Beelzebub. Like Beelzebub, that are way there and they want physical bodies. Yeah. Right? But there's always a mercy in divinity. And you know that that demon can repent, do the work, and become a great initiate. Yes. But uh, not all of those demons were waiting for that. They know that by law they have to receive bodies because the law always give opportunity to demons to repent. So the Sabbath started. That means that the work with sexual magic started. Hey, I committed the mistake, I said one of the demons. In my past lives and cosmic days, I became a demon and I like it. But now I'm repented and I'm willing to work. Can I have a physical body? And obviously they will receive physical body. But, you know, demons lie because that's why they are <laughs> demons. They are demons. So therefore, they were like holding them, right? Not to interrupt with the new souls that are coming from the animal kingdom and that are learning, right? How to transmute. And anyhow, it happens in that way because some demons started teaching Black Tantra to those souls that were immature. And that's precisely the mistake that happened uh, at that time in Lemuria, that you can uh, read about it in different aspects, how uh, humanity fell by not obeying the law of the Sabbath. You shall not eat from that fruit. And still those people that follow the Sabbath, 
they follow different rules, but in the very moment when they have to transmute, they don't transmute, they fornicate. Yeah. So they are violating the law of the Sabbath. Sad, but it's what it is. So on the, the slide that had the, the tarot card of the hangman, it talked about uh, combining, combining the cross with the triangle. Is that referring to the medieval <coughs> symbol of alchemy and sulfur? Yeah, of course. We uh, talked in other places and other times that uh, the cross that is formed by, with the legs of the hanged man and the triangle that is formed with the tide of uh, his uh, arms symbolizes uh, the chemical work that we had to perform with sulfur, which uh, obviously all of us start like that. By doing this work, eventually we'll invert, right? doesn't mean that because we know this mystery and today we started doing the work, we are no longer the hanged man. We are all standing, right? No. In order to invert that position, it takes time, a chemical work, because the triangle of the spirit has to be above the cross. But right now we start with the cross dominating the triangle of the spirit. And the triangle of the spirit represented by his head. Because remember that in our head as well, we have the triangle of Keter Choma Binah. And always, uh, even in the torso, the thorax, we found the other triangle, right? Which is Hesed, Gebura, and Tiferes. But they are down. And the cross, which represents the four bodies of sin in this way, are above. And all of us. So when we start this alchemical work, we start, that's why it's very difficult, because we are working against the forces of nature in us and the cosmos. But little by little, we are inverting the, the symbol the, and putting the triangle above us. All right? But that is the representation precisely of, uh, of this uh, alchemical work of the 12th uh, arcana in which we are uh, transmuting the seed, as you see there, is hanging from a tree. He is the seed of that tree, which is Malkut. We have to transmute that, right? In order for the light to shine in our heads as it is shining there in the hanged man by the work of alchemy. Remember that. That's why the 12th Arcanum is called the Apostolate. Because it's a long work that we got to do in order to invert. And for that, if we invert it, we enter into the 13th, which is the death of the cross. Yes? What is the question in synthesis? Uh, Tell me. Uh, who is the eagle that eats the serpent? Is it eagle? Eagle. Yeah. yeah. The eagle that eats that serpent is Bina. And the serpent is Bina. So it's the same thing. It's the same force. What happened is that that serpent, Bina, the serpent, is the one that goes to Malkut. And we work with it. It's a brass and serpent. Now we work with it. And when the brass and serpent finishes his work, which means the annihilation of all the ego in her son, then the ego comes, which is a superior aspect of her, and swallow her, but within her is already his son. And that is a transformation of uh, Bina, the serpent, Bina, the ego, and the son, Tifereth. The other question? Yeah. yeah. Can we talk about uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac for, for a minute? So, um, Abraham's a said, and uh, Isaac is uh, a Geberah. Right? 
And so Abraham goes to sacrifice, uh, sacrifice Isaac. So you said this is related to, uh, to karma, and mm -hmm. how, um, because Geburah is, is karma. Yeah. Uh, is so, but is Geburah really the one getting, getting sacrificed there? It seems like, like, like I'm the one getting sacrificed, and Geburah's up there sitting pretty. <laughs> right? No, Isaac is, of course, the outcome of the work of the fire of Geburah. Okay. Because Geburah, as Matthew Samael explains, is booty. And from Budi, from Geburah, descend Eros. Yeah. Eros is the fire that descends into Malkut, where is uh, the psyche, the consciousness. So that's the aspect of Geburah. Yeah. Not and when, when, when the initiate finishes the work in Malkut, which is the first serpent, mm -hmm. the first fire that awakes, obviously that fire of Eros has to uh, pass to a certain transformation. It cannot remain there in the physicality. I mean, the virtues and powers, because what the ego will do with that. Terrible. So there has to be absorbed, has to be sacrificed by Abraham. But when he's going to do it in the alchemical manner that we are explaining here, Something is hidden there in order to show how to do it. Because in the end, Isaac is not sacrificed, but the ram. But that ram is the fire of Geburah. Okay. That means that through the working of Brit Esh, the pact of the fire, is how you redeem your own karma. And your own initiation is saved in Abraham because he's absorbed. Right? It doesn't remain. That's what we have to understand. The work of the first initiation of mayor mysteries remains in chesed. It's absorbed by chesed. Never physically. Yeah? Does that have any, any correspondence to the, uh, one of the initiations of some of the uh, secret societies throughout, throughout time where you have to, you have to kiss the goat of Baphomet, um, and when you go when you go in there, there's there's someone representing the infrared or divine instead. Yeah, it's related with it. The goat of Baphomet, of course, is a, a symbol uh, that represents represents uh, the chemical work that we had to perform. To go behind that uh, symbol or statue in order to kiss uh, uh, his butt, right, was a, a demanding from, from, from that society to any initiate. And when he was going to do it, he, a door was opened secretly and, and, and uh, a vestal was receiving him into the temple. Welcome, now you are going to receive the mystery of alchemy. But those were, they were afraid because they saw the horns of the ram, whatever, or, or, the, or the goat, and were afraid because they said, oh, this is the devil they were not admitted into the mysteries of alchemy. And that is in relation also with this uh, mystery that we're explaining of Abraham and Taish, right? That you see that the word Bereshith hides that. This Bera Taish, Taish, right? In the first word of, uh, of the book of Genesis. And Taish means goat or ram, but means fire too. So by doing that, uh, this is how we work with our own spirit and with our own fires. In order to be pardoned, we will, will say, by the law. Because still, when you start, you have a lot of debts still. But you are pardoned because Abraham goes into the right side of the tree of life and is working with the ram. So sacrifice the ram, good. That's what we had to do. And that's what is hidden in it. And this uh, precept, yeah? So, um, and evening passed and morning came, and that was the first day. You said the evening was, was Isaac and the, 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 the morning was, was uh, Abraham. Yeah. Why? Because Malkut mm -hmm. is evening, is the female aspect. Okay. Right? Malkut is always a female aspect. The woman is the moon. Okay, the so man is the sun. 
So Malkut being the evening, and Isaac is the outcome of the first serpent, which is Malkut. So it's the evening. And because when the initial enters into this path, he starts worshiping the evening. Because the sexual act should be performed only in the night. Because only in the night we can make light. It will be absurd now there is sunlight here to light a candle. Why are we going to light a candle right now? <laughs> but if you do it in the night, it makes sense. Also, the sexual chemical work, in the night you make light. If you do it during the day, for the annihilation of the ego, it's good. But if you don't annihilate the ego during the day, and you only perform, the solar light doesn't go there. You fortify your physicality, but that flame doesn't go up into the spinal column, into the medulla. In the night, yeah, because it's darkness. The baby in the womb of a woman grows up in the darkness. Imagine if that womb will be open and the rays of the sun will affect the child, it will grow. It needs to grow in, in the darkness of the womb. Same in spiritually. But the problem is that there are many demons of the night that like to bother the alchemists. And that's the work of the Sabbath. He says the Sabbath is holy, but the witch's Sabbath is not holy. Yeah, but there's a lot of work with it, yeah? One more quick question. Um, a few slides ahead, back to the slide uh, on Shiva, sort of at the top of it. Now forward, 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 forward. Uh, this one. Okay. Um, what, is, what is this? Uh, the Holy One had, however, provided a remedy against this perceptive catastrophe by hastening on the animal folk the coming, the coming of the, the sexual chemical. So what does it mean is, ha is hastening the, the Sabbath? Is it, it's, it's, it's starting their, um, it's having, it's having the, the teaching. The teaching. The teachings. Because the soul, the animal souls were divided. You know, in the beginning, the physicalities of the Lemurians were androgynous. Yes. Two sexes in one body. But when these two sexes were divided in two, which is represented by Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. they haste for the Sabbath to teach them. Okay. So because if they don't do it, the demons from other cosmic days will teach them to fornicate okay. and how to awake the, uh, the Kundabafer, mm -hmm. the tale of Satan, which they did, obviously, but after they were taught. Because in the beginning, the couples in Lemuria were obeying the law of the Sabbath in the temples, and they were alchemically in chastity. But later on, they were infected by the demons that were already having physical bodies. And they were teaching those souls how to perform the sexual act with orgasm. And since that time until now, they skip teaching it. Now they are very active in the internet with pornography. And the souls are easily entered into the wide path. But that's why we are teaching this very clear. And for those souls that want to be into the light, they had to fight a lot. Not only during the night with the transmutation, but during the day also. Because temptations are now uh, everywhere. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.